Welcome to War Games on Toast, all of you lovely people. I am once again back talking about the latest edition of Warcry, and I am once again back talking about warbands. Today, I am talking about another bespoke Warcry warband, one with a love of poisons and snakes. Of course, I am talking about the wonderfully sinister Splintered Fang. But before we get into all of that, please consider dropping a like, leaving a comment, and subscribing to the channel. Your support helps me fight against the dastardly YouTube algorithmic demon. But without further ado, let's get on with the show. So who are the Splintered Fang? What do they want and why do they like poison? Heck, what's with the weird fascination with snakes? We can only solve this mystery with a little bit of story time. So grab yourself a warm drink and an electric blanket. We're going to dump some lore right on your lap. The followers of Chaos all follow different paths. Whether they are blood drenched and unabound, plague ridden and welcoming, scheming yet mad, or just lustful for all mortal desires. Among the many warrior cults, the Splintered Fang forged their own path, one where poison was an accepted form of combat, not a cowardly tactic. The Splintered Fang are really interesting. Poisons do feature in other warbands, but the Fang really like their poisons. This is represented by their snakes forms, snake themes, and even their mechanics on the tabletop. Where some warbands rely on raw strength to bring down their foes, the Splintered Fang ignore any and all defences. It's a rather unique way to play, although one that does have some serious drawbacks as we will soon see. Now, before we dive into their stats, I think it's always important to cover things that really make the Fang tick on a more universal level. These are often reactions and abilities that every member of the warband can use, and these should always be in the front of your mind at all times. We will start with their reaction, as this is probably the easiest to understand, and can be blitzed in no time at all. It is called Vicious Repost, and it reads... A fighter can make this reaction after they are targeted by a melee attack action, but before hit rolls are made. For each roll of a 1 or 2 from that attack action, allocate 2 points of damage to the attacking fighter. This is, to be perfectly blunt, counter, but better. Or at least situationally better. As we will soon see, the Splintered Fang are not the toughest guys going, so they tend to get smacked around a fair bit. Vicious Repost gives you a very reliable way of dealing damage to opponents who are hitting you on a 3+, or even a 4+. In these instances, especially against a 3+, to hit target, Vicious Repost can do quite a bit of work. Whether it's worth burning an AP to use is something you will need to weigh up in game yourself, but as a general rule, the cheaper the model, the better this becomes. Not to mention, if your guy is going to die anyway, you may as well go out with a bang. This is counter plus through and through, and let's just move on. The next on the block is Poisoned Attacks. This is the ability that makes Splintered Fang a real threat on the battlefield. It's a double and it reads, Until the end of this fighter's activation, the strength characteristic of attack actions made by this fighter count as being higher than the target's toughness characteristic. This is outstanding and does something shockingly rare in Warcry. It replaces Onslaught as your go-to double. Kind of. If you're hitting on a 4+, plus, then Onslaught is statistically more reliable. But if you're hitting on a 5, screw Onslaught and pump this every single time without question. This even lets your weakest units reliably damage the toughest enemies in the game. Sure, you might not be hitting for much, but you are hitting noticeably more often. The more attacks your guys get, the better this becomes, especially if you're hitting minimum damage too. There are a fair few models in this faction that fit that bill, so you will be burning dice on the regular to get those solid hits in turn after turn. Every faction needs a tin opener, some kind of unit that can punch through the toughest targets and land reliable damage. Every single model in Splintered Fang fits the bill at any given time. This is a very, very nice ability. The final ability that can be used by every model in the Fang 
is a rather expensive one. It's a quad and it's called Paralyzing Venom. It reads, until the end of this fighter's activation, add the value of this ability to the damage points allocated to enemy fighters by each critical hit from attack actions made by this fighter. In addition, until the end of this fighter's activation, after each attack action made by this fighter, roll a dice. On a roll of a 5 plus, until the end of this battle round, the target fighter cannot make move actions or disengage actions. This ability is interesting. I like it, but it's very expensive since it is a quad. After running some quick numbers, this is probably going to be better than Rampage in most cases, providing you have a very high quad to burn. We're talking about like a six. There are some stipulations though. You want to have a lot of attacks. Four to five is the minimum to get the most out of this. You also want a higher crit value in general. So a four or a five. You don't want this on a, th on a crit of three. Now, despite those stipulations, this can be quite the Hail Mary ability that can make just about anything in your warband horrifically threatening. When your basic guys can hit for a crit of 10, you can make staggering trades just by rolling dice and getting lucky. I think overall I do prefer Rampage for the mobility factor and the lack of dice value reliance. However, Paralyzing Venom is very interesting and I have gotten some truly outrageous results. I have had a 65 point chaff model one shot a Centaurian Marshal almost five times his cost. There is also the added benefit of having a built in net effect this is not reliable though and it's not really the focus here. If you want to net someone, well we have better nets in the faction. If you want to kill someone, then you use this. The net effect is a nice bonus if you fluff those murder rolls. But now we have a basic understanding on what the splintered fan can do as a whole. Let's look at the units on an individual basis and see what they are all about. As per usual, I'll be breaking down any unique abilities as I go. Starting with the only leader we have access to, and therefore the only mandatory model in this faction, we have the True Blood. The True Blood is pretty darn good, if a little bit pricey for what he brings statistically. This guy rocks up with movement 4, toughness 4, and 20 runes, which is a very average defensive profile shared by most bespoke warbands. Offensively, this guy is range 2, attacks 4, strength 4, 2, 5 damage, which is pretty nice, especially with that higher crit, but overall, this guy isn't really going to wow you on the damage front. He is just good enough that people won't wander into his threat range, but he absolutely is not a powerhouse leader. Of course, this guy is a prime candidate for both poison attacks and paralyzing venom. In fact, his paralyzing venom is the most damaging of all the venoms you can do. What makes the True Blood special, however, is his unique ability, his access to ensnaring net. Now, as you all know, I love nets, and this guy has one of the best nets in the business. It has a range of three, which is standard, but also a little bit awkward since the True Blood Spear is only range two. However, it also never misses. There is no RNG at all here. You use this ability, and they can't move. That's it. That's them locked down. Why is this good? Well, nets can win you games in many situations. Nets can also keep a huge number of dangerous units locked down, especially when your net never misses. You don't want to deal with that Fom Red Crusher or Varen Guard? Well, throw a net and then move on. Bam, they are done. Not only that, some of our better units have access to range 3 weapons, which is naturally synergistic with the net. Finally, the True Blood is wonderfully splashable outside of this warband because of his net. If you want a net in a non-net faction, then this is your cheapest option as far as I'm aware. Within the Splintered Fang, you need to take one, but I would not be surprised if you dabbled in an extra one for even more netting action. In fact, I frequently take two. Next up, it's the Serpent Caller. This is, in my opinion, the coolest model in this warband, at least aesthetically. I also really like it in game two, even though I don't often bring one. The Serpent Collar is really solid, if a smidge on the expensive side, rolling in at 145 points. 
Stats wise, he's not too shabby. Movement 5, toughness 4, 15 wounds on the defence makes him hard to shift when compared to just about everything else. And that movement 5 lets him stay out of trouble and get to where he needs to be. Offensively, he has two profiles. His melee attack is range 2, attack 4, strength 4, 2, 4 damage. And his range attack is range 8 with no minimum, attacks 2, strength 4, 2, 4 damage. These are both very, very solid and funny enough, he ends up being one of the better units in a scrap. He's a little bit too expensive for what he brings to bring two in one list, but I do often find myself considering it because despite his wizard-like appearance, the Serpent Caller has hands. In terms of unique abilities, the Serpent Caller, as the name suggests, likes snakes and can use his unique ability, Snake Charmer, to grant allied fighters with the Beast Rune Mark a bonus attack action on a triple. This is surprisingly solid, has a 4 inch range and can be used on any beast you can bring. This includes Chaos Spawn, which is one of the better thralls you can take and they rock up with 30 wounds at a bargain price. Not too shabby if you ask me. Of course, it's intended to be used with the snakes you get in the box too and it has use here too, those snakes are surprisingly solid on the offensive. Speaking of snakes, next up we're going to talk about the serpents, and these guys are pretty darn snazzy. They come in at a rather expensive, and we mean prohibitively expensive, 90 points per base. They rock up with movement 6, toughness 2, and wounds 6, which to be perfectly blunt, is abysmal. For a 90 point model, these guys are significantly below the mark when it comes to defensive stats at this points cost. On the upside, their offensive stats are surprisingly good. Range 1, attacks 5, strength 3, 1, 4 damage. Whilst not groundbreaking, the fact that they can spike with crit 4 and they have 5 to 10 attacks per round, 15 with a nearby buffing Serpent Caller. These guys can do some serious work. These are crit fishers through and through and they are arguably the best at it. I have on occasion even used Paralyzing Venom on these guys and yes, it was disgusting. We are looking at an average of around 20 damage with this, which is well within assassination territory. Like with everything in Splintered Fang, serpents can swing up. It's just a shame they are so expensive and so squishy. I would recommend maybe using Onslaught on them to push their crit even more and I wouldn't take more than one base. Taking more than one might be too much of an investment and honestly at that point I would much rather take one spawn over two serpents and what's even better the spawn is actually cheaper than two serpents. So there's always that. And now we are getting into our frontline fighters and the pure blood is the most elite of the bunch. The Pure Blood comes in at a respectable 115 points and has movement 4, toughness 4 and 12 wounds. This is fine and about what you'd expect defensively for a model in this price range. Offensively, the Pure Blood is quite good too with attacks 4, strength 4, 2, 4 damage. Unfortunately, he does only have a range of 1 which is not great and why I often just cut this guy out entirely. For 30 points more, you can get a second Serpent Caller, which has more movement and more range and a range attack. It's quite the bump in points, but I would argue it's probably worth it. The Appear Blood isn't bad, I just find it hard to justify taking one when it doesn't quite hold up compared to our other options. Now, that being said, having 4 attacks at 2-4 damage is still very nice, making him ideal for Onslaught when hitting on 4+, plus and Poison when hitting on 5+. plus. He will deal reliable damage, and his damage is fine overall. He has a unique triple called Relentless Assault, which lets him move an attack after he lands a kill. This is really not going to be used all that often, since you will nearly always use Onslaught or Poison, since he will struggle to kill otherwise. You are gambling your actions this turn to get an extra move and attack, and I don't think it will pay off enough to be worth that risk. Stick to the basics, and he will do what he needs to do. And now we come on to the Venom Blood. These guys come in four variants, but in your box, you can only build two. With the first lot, you can build either a whip or a spear, and the second, you can either take dual blades 
or a whip and a blade. One is a human and one is an elf. We'll keep this short and sweet since these are not all that interesting. Whilst the spear on the human does have a higher minimum damage and the pair blades on the elf gets more attacks, the whip options on both are nearly always better. This is because they have range 3 and this synergizes way too well with the true blood. In fact, I always run my true blood with venom blood for this very reason. Now, the elves are cheaper and have lower strength than the humans, but come with more movement. Strength isn't that much of a hit thanks to poison, but it's worth considering when you are a little bit dice tight. I would also consider the dual blades on the elf if you wanted to save 20 points on a pure blood since they are painfully similar in terms of stats. The humans both have access to the fanged buckler, which basically justifies why they are 10 points more than the elves. This does a flat 3 damage on a 3+. plus. Basically, it's shield bash, but it's better than most other warbands. This damage spike is very nice, but you probably won't get to use it since you're dancing around the edges with your range 3, and fanged buckler caps out at range 1. Plus, your dice are better spent elsewhere, in my opinion. Venom Blood are great overall. They are solid mid-tier infantry and synergize with many elements found within this box. And finally, we get to our chaff, the Clear Blood. These guys are mostly fine, but as is to be expected, are designed to hold objectives and get in the way. They won't get many kills, and even when they do get into a brawl, their damage is pretty poor, so will likely bounce off most things. They come in two flavours, with the only difference between them being the shield has plus one toughness and the two weapon guy has plus one attack. Honestly, the best part about these guys is their wounds 10 and the cost of 65 points a pop. They are well pointed for what they bring to the table and you will always take a few of these to bulk out your force. Of the two, I vastly, vastly prefer the shield variant since he is far more survivable and has access to Fang Buckler. In fact, the shield dude is the best unit to use the Fang Buckler with since he is only got a 1 inch range on his attacks anyway. Unfortunately, this box doesn't let you build more than one shield clear blood, which is a crying shame. This is an old box, and unlike newer boxes, the options are painfully restricted. Thankfully, the dual weapon guy is fine, and he will do the job adequately. Keep these guys safe, then rush objectives when the time is right. Use their reaction and deal some decent damage on the defensive, and you are good to go. So looking at everything the Splintered Fang bring to the table, I see a few clear strengths and some pretty glaring weaknesses. On the plus side, they have some decent models here. The True Blood and Serpent Collar are very nice, and even their more mediocre units like the Pure Blood are actually fine. Their Chaff is affordable and spammable, which is always good, and while Serpents are a bit too expensive for my liking, they are far from being bad. And of course, poison attacks as a whole is excellent and really makes this faction sing, as does the access to a very powerful net. Now the downsides. These guys are soft and slow. They cap out at toughness 4, but go as low as toughness 2. They don't have much movement to really avoid or get to where they need to be. They will go down very quickly in a ship scrap, and their units are a little bit on the pricey side, making any loss surprisingly painful. Finally, their damage is not great. Sure, it's reliable, but it's not very high without getting lucky on those sneaky crits. Taking all of this into consideration when list building, you want to try and plug these gaps. A powerful ally with strong attacks and a buff body will do the trick, and we have a lot of those in Chaos. Now, speaking of lists, I have three for you today. One is right out of the box, one is my go-to list, and one is one I tried to make myself a while back in terms of theme, but I could never get to work. And then, of course, the Salty Sea came along and then cracked the code in one fell swoop. So I will include his list here too, and of course, you can find his link in the description. So we'll start with the box list. The only things you need to make this list is just having one box of Splintered Fang. For the leader, you have the True Blood, naturally. Fighters, you take one Serpent Caller, some Serpents, a Pure Blood. Then when it comes to building your Venom Blood, you want a Venom Blood with Whip and a Venom Blood with Whip and Blade. 
and then cap all this off with three clear bloods with paired weapons and one clear blood with shield. This is, in my opinion, the best way to run the fang right out the gates. We picked whips on everyone we could to synergize with nets and that's really all we had to decide. It will do great in most games, especially against other bespoke warbands. In a more competitive environment, you might struggle. Be sure to keep your clear blood safe and use them wisely to play the objective game. Remember, your serpents can also do this and are very fast. You could even hide them behind terrain and hope people forget about them. This might sound silly, but it does work. They are very missable in a sea of terrain and models. Now, with that out of the way, let's go on to my go-to list. This is very easy to build. It does require some conversion, maybe some eBay trolling, and you know, maybe even just buying two boxes of Splintered Fang. Um, but I've had a lot of success with this, and I went with the theme of trying to fix the Fang and plug their weaknesses. I came up with this. So we have two True Bloods. These guys have nets, they are decent in combat, and they have ranged two attacks. These guys are great, and having two is honestly just the best way to run them. With Fighters, we have two Venom Bloods with Whip and Blade, and then three Clear Bloods with Shields, and then topping all this off, we have an ally of an Ogroid Myrmidon. This list comes to 990 points, so feel free to upgrade a Venom Blood to a human. I just like the added movement, so I tend to run with two Elves. This list has 8 models, which is right on average, has a decent number of chaff models with shields that can do your objective work, and you have 2 nets. These nets can be wonderful at keeping enemies locked down, and of course, with whips everywhere, you can mess around and pluck away if needed. The addition of the Myrmidon adds movement, toughness, and damage to this list, in addition to some utility. The Myrmidon has a triple that can give other units a bonus attack action. This can be used to push your True Bloods or your Venom Bloods to do a bit more damage, although Onslaught on the Memodon tends to do better overall. And the final list we have is the Salty Sea list, and again, you can find his excellent video breaking down all six of the original Warbands of Warcry in the description. I will, of course, include the list here as well. The Salty Sea suggested bringing two True Bloods, which is something I am all for. For Fighters, he went with Serpents, a Venom Blood with Whip and Blade, a Venom Blood with Whip, a Clear Blood, uh, he didn't specify which, although I would say the Shield is probably the best way to run, and then the Ally, he recommends the Centaurian Marshal. This list also rolls in at 990 points and is rocking 7 models. What this list brings is a staggering amount of netting power and reach. You have three nets here, two on the True Blood and one on the Marshal. Not only that, the Marshal has a three inch range spear, letting him take advantage of any net you have. This is the core of your list, your True Bloods and your Venom Bloods working with the Marshal to lock everything down. I don't personally like the Serpents in this list, and I would drop them for a third Venom Blood with Whip and Blade, but the Serpents work here. The biggest downside of this list is the lack of Chaff. You have one Clear Blood, making it harder to mess around on the objective side. That being said, three Nets makes it harder for your opponent to do the same. This list looks to be very fun and honestly, really effective. This is a great list by the Salty Sea. But that's all I have for you today. If you made it this far, then thank you. Your support means a lot. Please remember to leave a like, comment, and subscribe as it helps the channel grow and reach more Warcraft players. Let me know down below how you run the Smash Fang and if you have any extra tips and tricks to throw into the mix. Until next time, I'll see you in the next video. Ta ra!